I want to welcome you here today. My name is Dennis Cooley. I am past president and uh, current treasurer of the uh, Phi Kappa Phi chapter at NDSU. And I will be introducing some things, but the big work is off my shoulders on more important shoulders, and I'll get to those in just a moment. NDSU is proud to partner with ND the NDSU chapter of Phi Kappa Phi to offer the fall NDSU Phi Kappa Phi faculty lectureship. This is from fall. Pretend we're in autumn. The lectureship was founded in 2015 through um, President Brashani, and it was to showcase faculty talents that exemplify Phi Kappa Phi's mission and motto, let the love of learning rule humankind. The criteria for evaluating nominees and for receiving the award is uh, to those individuals who have outstanding high impact research scholarship or creative activity consistently supports NDSU's top tier research status and who have a proven ability to effectively present their research to a broad community in the land grant tradition. And so that's what we've had since 2015. I will now make a few notes for folks. Number one, this is being recorded. So I wanna make sure everyone understands that. If you're online or you're using the online facility Zoom, the chat is locked until the Q&A se session after the end of the talk. And then finally, the second Phi Kappa Phi lectureship will be given by Sam Markell on February 20th. It is my pleasure to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker, um, Greg Lardy, Vice President of Agricultural Affairs, Phi Kappa Phi member for a very long time, and a really great guy to know if you want to know this. Thank you, Dennis. As uh, Dennis mentioned, I have the privilege of serving as Vice President for, Vice President for Agricultural Affairs. And uh, with that role, I uh, get to introduce uh, this afternoon's speaker. So Dr. William Ganji is a decorated and globally respected professor and chair of the Agribusiness and Applied Economics Department. He is currently on developmental leave with the Economic Research Service, and I, he's going to talk about uh, some of the work that he's doing with them uh, at the end of his presentation today. William has published several journal articles, two books, book chapters, and technical reports in food and financial risk analysis and policy. He's won four best journal articles and two national teaching awards, including the best applied economics graduate teaching professor in the United States from the Ameri American Applied Economics Association in 2022, and the Western Agricultural Economics Association outstanding undergraduate teacher with less than 10 years experience in 2005, and in 2010 was named the best journal article award for agribusiness and international journal. William has published in several top journals, including the American Journal of Agricultural Economics, Energy Economics, Ecological Economics, the Canadian Journal of Agricultural Economics, Agricultural Finance Review, the Journal of Agriculture and Resource Economics, Food Policy, British Journal of British Food Journal, Journal of International Trade and Development, Agribusiness and Internet and the Agribusiness International Journal. He is an associate editor for the International Food and Agribusiness Management Review and a guest editor for the Journal of Risk and Financial Management. William has given several conference and town hall presentations on food risks, including food safety, food defense, and obesity. He came to NDSU in 1998. Please help me welcome William to the podium. I think I would like to move around a little bit as I present, um, but at first I want to thank Greg for that wonderful presentation. And then I want to thank the faculty uh, selection committee for giving me this honor to present today. Um, then my department, we have an awards committee that nominated me. So Dr. Weikengam and the others, I want to thank them as well. Um, then the audience, those of you guys in the audience, I know we have, uh, my wife is here, my strongest supporter, my better half. So thank you for coming. And uh, my son-in-law who just came from South Korea is here also. And uh, he, he kind of blessed us with our first grandson. So he's also called William. He's about four and a half, four years now. So little William is a very nice person to be around. I also want to thank all of you guys again in the audience and those of you who are remote online. I want to thank you all. 
So this is an area that I've been working on for the last 20 some years. Um, I came to the University of Illinois, January 3rd, 1993. I'll tell you my first food story. You know, I came there, left Cameroon, originally from Cameroon and left Cameroon. They say, you gotta get a coat. I had a jacket like this. I said, I think I'm fine. I'm warm enough. <laughs> I landed in Chicago, took a plane, went to Champagne, stepped out of the airport, and I honestly thought I was going to die. <laughs> it was so cold. The cold went straight into my bones. I asked the taxi guy to take me to the nearest hotel. He took me to the hotel. I slept, got up in the morning around 11 o'clock. Our flight came and I said, I'm so hungry, I want to eat. And they said, well, breakfast is gone. We have brunch on the 11th floor. So I went to the 11th floor and I saw this beautiful banquet. I said, is there a wedding here? They said, no, there's no wedding. It's a buffet. I didn't have a clue what a buffet was <laughs> coming from Africa. There's all kinds of good stuff. I said, how much do you pay? They said, $6. Back in the days, you pay $6, you can all you can eat. And I saw ribs that have been grilled, chicken that has been grilled, beautiful stuff. So I sat down. I took my first plate. I loaded it up, the chicken and the ribs, my favorite, and I beat the chicken. It was sweet. I'm like, what is this? So I called the guy <laughs> who was serving us. I said, why is this chicken sweet? He said, oh, yeah, we put some sweet barbecue sauce on it. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, if you're coming from Africa the first time, we put spices on chicken, hot pepper, not sweet barbecue sauce. So that was my first welcome to America, the magnitude of the food and the sweetness of the food. I ate the first plate. I was still hungry. And I asked them, I said, can I eat some more? Oh, yeah, it's $6. Eat as much as you want. I grabbed the second plate. I grabbed the third plate. <laughs> After I was done eating, I could not wake up from that chair. <laughs> I barely stood up slowly, went to my room, passed out till the next day. But that reminded me how much food we have in the United States. You know, we are so blessed. You walk into the grocery store here, you see all kinds of variety like you will never see anywhere else. You go to a buffet, you see all kinds of selections like you never see anywhere else. So I've been working in this area, food risk, for at least 20 some years. And um, it's an interesting topic because food and health, you know, all of us, we know if we eat well, we can avoid some diseases that might come our way, right? So what are we doing in the United States to make sure this food that we eat is safe? So this is the outline. See my stuff kind of froze. This is the outline what we're going to be talking about today. So we're looking at some emerging issues. And again, my area of research is food safety, or food risk, and financial risk analysis. I'm not going to talk about the financial aspects of what I've done. I'm only going to talk about the food risk side of it. So these are some areas that have emerging. So from the farm level, you have a fusarium head blight and scab, or what we call scab. I don't know if most of you know what uh, scab is. In, um, in the United States, small grains, wheat, barley, corn, uh, when there's heavy moisture in the field, it develops a fungus. And that fungus leaves behind a toxin. And that toxin, we call it deoxyavalinol or DON, or vomitoxin. For human consumption, it has to be less than one part per million. But for livestock, it can be between one part per million and four parts per million. And um, if animals eat it, they vomit. Like pigs, when they eat a lot of it, grains that have more than four parts per million, they vomit. So they call it vomitoxin. So I've been doing some work on estimating the economic impact of that disease for the entire United States. So we'll talk about some of the policy work there as well. Then obesity epidemic. It's an epidemic. Um, I'll show you some graphs and some stuff uh, in the United States. Then food safety. 
Um, food safety, we define food safety as unintentional contamination of food, right? So it's not intentional. It's just natural occurring salmonella, E. coli, listeria, campylobacter, pathogens, okay? However, food defense, um, it's intentional contamination of food by either disgruntled employees or terrorists. So these are areas that we've been doing some work with. So what is policy doing to make sure that our food supply is safe? So I'll talk about some of the policy areas that I have personally done research on and then look at how we can uh, evaluate our food supply. The first one will be additional funding that we've got gotten for SCAP research and then um, some work that we've done in terms of what policies are effective should we limit intake of sugar? Should we put a tax on sugar? We'll talk about that. Then the traceability mandate. So in 2010, when President Obama, uh, he passed the biggest food safety bill in 60 years in the United States. And that food safety bill now require every food importer or supplier to have a traceability system and a HACCP system in place. So we'll talk about that. I was part of the analysis. I did some of the analysis for that. Then um, food transport risk. And this is where we'll talk a little bit about terrorism, how we can mitigate terrorism in terms of food transport. Then finally, this is a very controversial topic, right? This is one of the topics that everybody around the world, they look at it, they don't understand it. They're like GMOs. Is this good for us? Even in the United States, some folks are still, cons they were still confused about GMOs. But I've been doing research. I had a best paper from food distribution research on this. I just had a paper from ecological economics on this. And we just wrote a grant. So Sandra and I wrote a grant with another folks on this topic. So we'll talk about all those issues. So let's look at some of these natural or emerging risk or current risk. And let's start with the vomitoxin and done. Um, again, like I discussed, it's a serious occurrence. We've had situation in the US where there's a lot of recall, especially in the pet industry. You know, there's, uh, you see the study there by um, Baker, 350 cats died, 350 in 2001. Why? because they ate grain, pet food that was made with high level of vomitoxin. You know, there was another company that was completely shut down because dog food was contaminated as well. Um, and for humans, for us, um, for those who drink beer made from barley, sometimes if you open a bottle of beer and it gushes, right? That is an indication that the dawn level might be high. So if you eat, if you drink that, you ignore that, again, it can cause cancer. So it's a serious occurrence. But what we have done um, from our study, and we started doing this study a long time ago. I've been at NDSU, like Greg said, since 1998. And this was one of the first projects that I took on, just to look at the economic impact of SCAP for wheat and barley for the entire United States. So the direct impact alone, and these are direct impacts. So we looked at every state with scab, the grain is poor quality when it's affected, but also when it has done, there's steep price discounts, right? So we looked at that 1.4 billion, and that's just the direct loss alone. Then the secondary impact, because you look at all the beer making firms, those done, it clogs the pipes, a lot of cleaning. There's a lot of greens that is, should be discarded. So if you look at the secondary impact, you can multiply that by 2.4%. So with that, during this early study that we did, we did not really have any initiative that was solving some of these issues. And when our policymakers saw this, they say maybe we should do something. So I'll talk about that later on. 
to look at some of the policy work that have been done to provide funding for research for this. Okay, so this is the big one, um, obesity. I remember around 2009, 2010, I was a faculty at Arizona State and um, our undersecretary for agriculture he had sent an email to me. He said, I'm going to North Dakota and the region to talk about sweet tax. We're gonna put a tax on sugar. And I've seen that you've done these publications on addiction and other things related to obesity. So send me five talking points, why we should or we should not do the sweet tax stuff. So, I looked at him, I sent that response to him, and I'm going to show why some of this policy, like taxes on sweets, are ineffective. And why did I say that? Because if you look at the poor people, right? I went down south, Greg and I, we did the Food Systems Leadership Institute. They gave us $5 to go shop for a family of four. $5. That's what a family of four in some of the southern states in the U.S. still live on today. And we went, we tried to buy some rice, some beans. We bought some bananas. My group, we bought some bananas. And then some of them will buy some kind of pop and cook. If you put a tax on sweets, who are you penalizing? Right? The very poor that might be their only source of calories that they have for the day. For the rest of the population, food is one of the only items in the U.S. where real prices have been declining. I know you go to the grocery stores, you look at food prices, you're like, boy, these prices are going up. But compared to the share of income that we are spending on food in the United States, if you look at the share of income, it's going down every year. It's now around 11%. It used to be about 16%. That's the share of income that we spend in the United States on food. So what does that mean? Real food prices have been going up. So if you have been going down, if you have to put a tax, 10 cents on a can of Coke, and you want to consume Coke, would you say, I'm not going to consume Coke because of 10 cents? Maybe not, right? Because the income that you spend on that food is not that significant. So we'll talk about uh, excess consumption of sugar and sweets. Uh, that's some of the problems that we've had. But again, look at the occurrence of obesity, almost triple. And no state is left behind. Every single state in the US and the world, it's not just the United States. I'm focusing on the United States, but you look at the whole globe. And I was giving a town hall presentation here at the Sons of Norway way back on this issue. And there was one lady who was so mad. He stood up, he said, these poor people, you know, they are messing us up because they are obesity. They eat all kinds of junk. And then another lady got up and I think Megan was chairing that town hall session. She said, I am poor, I'm a single mother. I don't look fat. And I corrected all of them. I said, you both are right. Obesity issue, if you look at the middle segment or the middle income folks in the US, the very poor segment, they have limited occurrence of obesity. The extremely rich segment, have limited occurrence of obesity. But the middle segment, they are so busy with children. They want to eat fast foods. They are running. They're taking care of some. Then they eat all this stuff that makes. So you look at that middle segment. That's where we really have a problem in the U.S. So all of them felt good after we gave. I told them that. But obesity is one of those diseases that we spend billions. Had disease all the different issues that we face in the US because of trying to correct some obesity related illnesses, billions. And for the first time in US history, they said this is the only time where kids might not live as long as their parents. 
for the first time in our history. When they did the projection on life expectancy, they said, this is the first time that kids might live not as long as their parents because of obesity issues. So it's a serious issue in the US. So what are we doing to solve this problem? We'll talk about some policy that has been going on. Then our uh, food safety risk, this is one that I spent my area career. My PhD dissertation was on HACCP analysis in the US red meat industry. And when I did my PhD dissertation, uh, for the first time, I looked at what we call oligopoly. You know, they were trying to pass the HACCP law that everybody should implement HACCP back in 2000. 1999, 2000, all the meat and poultry firms must implement HACCP systems. And one of the first studies that we did was all the big companies had some form of quality control, but the very small guys had none, nothing. So there will be disproportionate cost distribution if everybody had to implement it at the same time. So the US government developed what we call generic models for small farms. And then they schedule it out. So the very big guys implemented HACCP in 1999, the medium-sized guys in 2000, and then the very small in 2001, because they give them more time and they give them more support. So we want these policies to be implemented, but we want to make sure it doesn't affect industry. Again, losses from food safety, 3,000 people die. I'm pretty sure all of you in here or those who are listening online, you have eaten food sometimes, you're like, boy, this makes me sick, right? And that's good. It only made you sick. But if it's a little baby, somebody who is immune compromised, or an older person, they eat that same food that gave you a little sickness, they might have heart failure, organ failure, and death. So we lose about 3,000 people in the US every year because of food safety issues. So what are we doing um, to help out with this? Food terrorism. I know this is one that um, most of us are not aware of this. But after September 11th, in the caves of Tora Bora in Afghanistan, they found documents about the US food supply and how they can crumble the economy. You see, the goal of the terrorists is to do what? They had two goals, right? Kill as many people as possible and bankrupt the US economy. That is their two goals. And they look at issues like food and mouth and other very dangerous pathogens that if we do this in the US economy, it would destroy the entire economy, right? They found those documents in September 11th. And they've had some incidents where disgruntled employees, and one of them is in Michigan. See that Michigan incident in 2014, where you had two restaurant owners. One of them was trying to kick their competition out of business. So they deliberately went and contaminated their food with E. coli. So it has happened. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in the background. And that's what I want to let everybody know. Uh, there's a lot of work going on. I remember when um, the first, when we had that incident in September 11th, the US established five centers for excellence. This, the, the one that I was involved, Tim Selno and myself from North Dakota, Minnesota, um, Wisconsin and Michigan State, those four universities, the partner, they gave us $15 million to create the first center for excellence. And we were tracking, we have more than 100 companies. We're tracking every food item produced out of this country, in this country, every chemical that can be used to contaminate the food supply. There's a lot of work going on in the background. So... The, the, the bad thing that makes it all difficult when I was teaching down at Arizona State, only about 1% of our food gets inspected. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the economic resources to put everybody to do inspection, right? 
So we only inspect about 1%. But some of the work that we have been doing, we're using RFID, and the challenge within these industries, we have the FDA, the Custom Border Patrol, the Food Safety Inspection Service, they don't talk to each other. So we said, well, if you guys really want to help, you have to communicate. So RFID was one of the technologies that we kind of worked on. I know you guys know electronic barcode RFID. They put it on a truck, it costs about $800. And that truck, when it leaves Mexico, there's a USDA person who verifies it before it leaves Mexico coming into the United States with fresh produce. But it tracks all the coordinates. It says this is where the truck is, this is the weight of the truck, this is the temperature inside. And it spits that data into a secure location every five minutes. So if all the agencies can coordinate, go in there and look at that truck, if some of the times we found situation where drug lords for companies that have fast, fast is fast and secure trade. They will kidnap those trucks because they know when they come through the border, they go straight through the, into the country. They will kidnap them, build a wall at the end of the truck and load it with drugs or human trafficking. But we have gamma technology, we had RFID technology that made sure when you do that, you open the truck, what happens to the temperature in the truck? We can see the temperature has changed, right? The weight of the truck has changed. Then it becomes a high-risk cargo. Then we can dedicate more inspection resources to that high-risk cargo. So a lot of work that has been going on to make sure that we can utilize that 1% more effectively. This is another one. Uh, now let me talk about some of these policy issues. And the research that we did, uh, we found out that the return on investment that SCAB, the US Weed and Bali SCAB initiative was established and they've done some wonderful work. They've done really great research. Um, they've put some fungicide management practices. Now farmers can spray. For those of you in plant science, farmers can spray at different times. I had my friend who was Velen Hens, who was here at NDSU, work with them together. And uh, they've also had some moderately resistant varieties. They don't have a resistant variety yet for scab, right? But for some crops, they have moderately resistant variety. And their return on investment is 34%. So every dollar we invest to help mitigate scab, we get 34% return on investment. In 2022, the investment, whether it's private sector and public sector, was about $8.6 million. And when President Trump was the president, the work that we had done, and Bill Wilson, myself, and some folks from the department look at this carb occurrence up till I think 2014, 2015, President Trump had given additional $3 million to this CARB initiative. And some of the research we had done on the cost was used to defend why this money was needed for additional research. So these are some early publications and some stuff that we've been doing to show that we need to put more money on SCAB research. So obesity, again, this is one that I just want to throw it out there. It's an addiction to sweets, right? Uh, I know there are lots of stuff you have to exercise, you have to run, get up in the morning, um, but this is a big piece of it. I wrote to the Undersecretary of Agriculture, like I said, I said, taxes on sweets will not work. I said, if you're gonna tax sugar and sweets, it will not be that effective. Why? Again, just like I said, the income we spend on food, but if we can limit access to vulnerable populations, so if you go now to most of the elementary schools, they used to load their vending machine with all the sweets and stuff. They've taken most of those things out. They try to replace it with healthy foods, right? Because if those little kids, your kids go to school, they have their little allowance, and they see a sweet popsicle that they want, what do you think they will buy? Go buy that sweet stuff. But if you limit access, then it makes it a little better. 
But our study, we have done um, a few studies that I've done. We did two of them on the addiction, rational and myopic addiction, right? A rational addict, what does that mean? If you increase price, they want to consume that food, they will still consume the food. A myopic addict, future or current price does not affect their consumption. So this is one of the studies that show the same part of the brain that normally stimulates drug and alcohol addiction. <laughs> Very sorry. <laughs> Somebody is probably trying to log in. And uh, it's a spam call. I know it's a spam call. Let me give it to my spouse. So sorry, guys. Yeah. So this is part of the ones that say what stimulates the brain. And most people have said sweets are not addicted, uh, addiction. But we did, in our study, we showed it's a stock variable. That sweet stuff that I ate my first day in the US, where you had a sweet barbecue sauce on my steak, right? In the US, we eat good food. We go to the restaurants. What do we do at the end? Oh, that piece of cake. <laughs> Dessert. And this was the first time I saw that. Because when I came from Africa, we eat at the end of the food. They give us a hot cup of tea or some fruits, right? But here, the sweet tooth make us eat more carbs. So with addiction issues, we cannot solve that issue without changing behavior. And the only way we can change behavior in some instances is access, like we've seen here. Then potion control, it's very hard. And this is one of my pet peeves. Miss avoiding, mislabeling, uh, of healthy foods. In England and the UK, there's a policy that you cannot market any food if the sugar and the salt content is higher than a certain level. It is no longer a healthy food. Here in the US, our healthy foods, you look at them, the sugar content is amazing, right? And one of my pet peeves, I don't know, one day maybe the USDA, I can work with them to say we should not label any food as zero fats. <laughs> I really think this is the most misleading labeling in the United States. Zero fats. And I tell folks, I say, if you put a cow in a fresh grass like bison and they eat a lot of fresh grass, what will happen? They'll get fat, right? Because everything you eat, the end product of metabolism is energy and the excess gets stored into fats. So when they put zero fats on products, People say, oh, zero fat, so I can increase my portion. And then it becomes really misleading because a lot of people increase the portion of what they eat because of that labeling that is on the product. So if I have my way, we should not be seeing anything in the grocery stores that say zero fat because I think it's very misleading. Okay, and it's not helping with the ob obesity issue. Then um, this is one that I think this traceability mandate I had to testify. I did all the cost benefit analysis. Three of us, myself, Helen Jensen, who was our president for American Agricultural Association. She was at uh, Iowa State. And then we had Mary Moth at the Research Triangular Institute. I did the cost benefit analysis for the traceability mandate using simple complex supply networks. And this is one that has been very helpful. I gave an example of shrimp that was being imported from China. It had high level of mercury. And we'll import that shrimp. It comes to the US, we reject it. There was no traceability mandate. It's a multinational corporation. They shipped it right to England and sent it right back to the United States. And if it's coming to England, we only inspect 1% of our food, what happens? It gets into the country. But now if we have a traceability tag on it, they can't do that anymore. This is something that happened in Cameroon. 10,000 pounds of rice, plastic rice. We cannot have these type of things in the US because we have a traceability mandate. I gave a presentation uh, in November in the Philippines to the World Rice Congress. And I told them, I said, you should at least encourage every country to have its traceability mandate because there are a lot of folks who can steal your packaging. 
But if you have your fingerprint on your packaging and they put junk in your packaging, you can say, that's not me, right? But if you don't have that mandate, then it's a problem. So we in the US, there are some studies that we've done, this traceability is effective. There was one incident, I remember an outbreak that we had from Mexico on peppers, jalapenos peppers. It took us 47 days to trace where that outbreak came from. With the traceability mandate, you guess how many days it's going to take us? Two. Right? Because all the firms keep data one step forward, one step backwards. So, again, these policies, some of them have been helping us. A lot of work going on in the background. And food terrorism, I already talked a lot about this. Uh, how am I doing on time? Good? I know I talk a lot. I can talk all day. So food terrorism, um, I talked about this RFID stuff that we use to make sure that containers that are coming in, but also to make sure these agencies are talking with one another because we have four agencies controlling food safety in the US. I was working my butt off in the, in, in, and try to just have them to give me data on this. No, they won't talk to each other. I have to get authorization from this person. Then I have to go get authorization from the Food Safety Inspection Service, the Custom Border Patrol. So just have that location, centralized location with the journey-based data and have these guys talking together can really help us, okay? So this is the controversial one um, that I think, uh, I'm gonna tell you guys some stuff about GMOs that I think most of you are not aware of. This is a paper we just published in Ecological Economics and um, I've looked at all these seven measures that is used by every country to say we don't want GMOs. And those seven measures, all of them are perceived risk attributes. None of them have actual hazard, none, right? Risk is hazard plus maybe misinformation, but none of them had actual hazard. So I started questioning, I said, GMO does have some benefits. And for the corn and soybean, we've been growing this for how many years? More than 95% of all acreage in the US is GMOs. For more than almost 30 years now, we've been eating these products, right? All of us should have been dead. So I started looking at some of the risk and risk premium that is associated with GM all the current measures that are protectionist or resistant measures, none of them have actual hazard. So some of the study that we'll be looking at in the future will be what are some of the measures that should be used by countries to really protect against some of these products, right? So, so this is one that I'm currently working on. These are some projects that I'm currently, this is an Apple. Every morning I like to eat an apple, that's my breakfast. I love to eat an apple in the morning, right? So um, my studies, what I've, I've been doing for most of my research, perception of risk, bias and resistance. So perception of risk has those four attributes. Locus of control, external locus, that means the federal government trying to help us make sure our food is not contaminated. Internal locus, that's us. That's us. We have a responsibility also to make sure what we eat is safe. For example, I love apples. I buy this apple. I normally wash my apples with warm or close to hot water before I eat it. I wash this apple and guess what popped up? This is a polished apple. These are nanoparticles. And for those of you who know, some of those nanoparticles can cause cancer. This is supposed to be one of the healthiest foods that we eat, an apple every morning, or five apples a day. But if the stuff is polished, then it becomes terrible for us, right? So what I will just advise, the internal locus of control is us. 
take some measures, wash your food, check it. If you see an apple like this, peel the skin off before you eat it. Don't eat the skin even though it has the best fiber content that you want to eat. So some of these things, a locus of control is important. Personal health influence, have I been sick? Somebody who has been sick from pathogen, they are more cautious, right? If I want to eat this stuff, I have a history. My child, my mother, somebody in the family has been sick, right? Demographic factors, I just talked about immune defense, imp immune compromised children, right? They don't eat the same thing that you eat or older people. Outrage, this is the one that has been used mostly for GMOs, that outrage factor. So we're doing some research on that. And the current research has submitted a paper to um, our AAEA conference on resistance, perception, resistance, and bias for GMOs. So I want to go deep, because most of the studies will look at just perception. And some studies will look at, I don't think any of them are looking at bias, our innate psychological bias. We have established indices that we've developed for all of them that I'll be looking at. So when you want to eat, I know the government is doing a lot. We also have to play a role. Yeah. So how safe is our U.S. food supply? You know, I'm, I'm currently working on my sabbatical with the USDA and the World Bank, and we're working with the FAO, and the U.S. is trying to take global leadership because we have a lot. We brag about having one of the safest food supply in the world. Why is that? There's a lot of work going on in the background. A lot of work that most of you guys don't see, but there's a lot of work, whether it's industry partnership, um, uh, federal government policy, there's a lot of work. That's why most people say the US have a very safe food supply system. But it's not the best, but it's one of the best in the world. And I want to end here. There's a new policy that will be coming down. It's a global policy that says if it's not, it is not food if it's not safe. And the World Bank is pushing this one, right? So it's not food if it's not safe. Because food can help us resolve some obesity, communicable disease. But if you're giving food to people that is not safe, it's not food. So I'm going to end my presentation here, and thank you all for coming. So hopefully they've turned on the chat for, I'm just trying to find Daniel, where is it, that uh, we've got the chat. And so, but we can also take questions from inside uh, this room. So I will give you this microphone back. And uh, this relates to terroristic threats. Uh, so, I mean, part of the situation is, you you know, to best stop terrorists, you have to kind of think, how will they think? Okay, so I'm saying that in advance of my question, so you don't think I'm plotting something. Uh, but on food terrorism, so what's to prevent or what, I mean, are we at risk? Like, we hear about fentanyl all the time, but if we ship large bulk shipments of grain from country to country, how do we ensure, or I mean, is there anything that can be done to ensure that some terrorist or a uh, bad person, bad actor, won't insert something like that in there where, where it could kill literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and it's very hard to trace because it's uh, in bulk and uh, or it could be done in railheads or or a variety of other ways. So I'm just kind of wondering, uh, you, know, are, you know, is this a possibility? And then how would it be traced back? So it, most of the work I've done, there's something called Cava Plus Shock. Cava Plus Shock is a survey, framework survey that is developed by the US Department of Agriculture and the Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security. It does identify all the vulnerabilities. 
in our food supply system. And then I've used it to say these are the areas where we should put controls using real option models. And say these are the weakest links in the system. Like I said, there's a lot of work going on in the background. And now we have traceability, which is a plus. So all the work that is going on in implementing cover plus shock, right? That is being implemented live as we talk. Uh, we're looking at all the entire system, the vulnerabilities of the system, what is being done to put controls to mitigate those vulnerabilities. All of that is ongoing. That's why I said there's a lot of work going on in the system. So if we say we have one of the safest food supply is because we can mitigate all those things near risk or near hazard. Some of them, we call them type one risk, type two risk. We have the ability to track those things, stop them on their tracks before they occur, right? It's not that one or twice or sometimes something might not happen, but we have a very solid system of surveillance that is going on. Thank you, William. Um, my question relates to the import inspections that the US government is doing. Um, these are for two reasons, why to identify any food risk, but also uh, risk related to invasive alien species. I'm wondering, are there any more data-driven approaches now in place actually to make sure that we identify the really risky endeavors of import and take them apart from those that we don't care about? I mean, is there more strategy to this 1%? Otherwise, how is that sampling actually going on? Yeah, so most of the work you guys know about AFIS. The AFIS has done a wonderful job in tracking foreign pests and stuff that might be coming into the country. They are doing a wonderful job. The work that I did with uh, RFID was to make sure that these agencies talk together. And uh, those technology is available now. If they can share data and talk together, this journey-based data that we have, we can track a lot of things. RFID unit is $800. You install that unit on a truck or a ship or a plane cargo because the U.S., anything that is imported into U.S., the U.S. has the U.S. Department of Agriculture almost in any country that we go. Before we export anything to the U.S., they inspect it there. And in Mexico, for example, they inspect it. They give it the fast designation that is fast and secure trade. So when those trucks come to the border, they have been inspected, they are sealed, they just drive right through, right? The ones that have not been inspected and sealed by the USDA in the foreign countries are the ones that take a lot of time at the border. So we have that RFID technology that these agencies, if they can share information, right, and use that technology to collect journey-based data, it can help with that problem. But I can guarantee you there's still some roadblocks with these agencies talking together. <laughs> there's still a lot of roadblocks. For those of you who do work with these four agencies, so you have the Food, uh, food Safety Inspection Service, the USDA. One of them is involved with just testing pathogen. The other one is involved with um, looking at maybe fresh produce. The other one, the FDA the custom, they all don't really communicate together. And I think if they can, then we can start feeling very comfortable that they are sharing information and we can avoid some of these problems. My only concern, uh, they have this system, some of them are doing it, it's not formal. They have to put a formal way of communicating together. What they are doing now, if you go there, they'll say, yeah, we're communicating together. I just talked to Sandy, the person I'm doing my sabbatical or developmental leave with. We're communicating. But when there's a budget crunch, a budget crisis, what happens? The first things to go are those communication links. Then everybody focus on their own interests, right? They don't longer communicate anymore because they had to put some resources so that's the problem we're having. And that's what we have to encourage, that they need to communicate. All these agencies involved in our food supply, they need to find a formal way to communicate, not ad hoc, not I'm going to do it if I feel like it. 
that's the challenge we're facing. Yes. Okay. Oh, I, just, I have a question. This is actually mine. Um, but I went to graduate school at Marquette University, which is located in a food desert. And I guess the mantra around in the inner city of Milwaukee was that it was easier to find a handgun than it was to find a tomato. And I guess what I was wondering about is um, how do we get more fresh produce into food deserts so that uh, families who live in inner cities have an alternative other than just the C store? Because basically that was the grocery store in the neighborhood where I lived, where they only sell chips and candy and soda. So do you have any thoughts about bringing vegetables into these areas? Yeah, so the, these uh, food deserts, uh, the USDA defined food deserts as locations within a certain mile that don't have a grocery store. We still have those locations. They don't have like a Walmart or a grocery store that carries this fresh produce. So if you need full fresh produce, you got to jump on the bus and drive ways to go get those fresh produce. Those locations still exist. And you're right, uh, there's a lot of work with uh, gardens. Uh, so when I was in Arizona, I was teaching down at Arizona State, there's a lot of initiatives in high school just to introduce kids to grow their own fresh produce. I work with the Native American communities as well. There's a lot of work going on and how they can grow their own fresh produce. Because some of these stores, it takes them, if they don't have 50,000 people in a location, they will not put a store at that location. And um, it's a challenge. Um, I don't know how we're going to do it. But I hope as population increase, this shows, oh, this is one thing that I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Uh, cooperatives. Cooperative organizations change the landscape of the United States. Uh, we enjoy electricity today in all the rural communities because of cooperative broadband because of cooperatives. We have in some grocery stores that are coming up that are cooperative organizations. And they go to locations not because they want to make profits all the time. They go there because it's their member's service. They have to service their members. I was a part of a judging team with um, some folks who went right up to Oxford. They were number two in the world. And they were looking at wa water issues in the Navajo nations and looking at the cooperative structure on how to bring that water issue. So I am hopeful with these food cooperatives that are coming up, they might be able to go to some of these areas where normal businesses will say it doesn't make sense to our bottom line to do it. Cooperatives have always found ways to do that. That's the one hope that I have. Other than growing their own food and using cooperative organization, the other hope that I have is that most businesses today are judged on the triple bottom line, right? Uh, most businesses today, they're not profit, 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 profit. It's profit, social responsibility, and environmental stewardship. So maybe with those initiatives going forward, we might see those food deserts get some fresh produce. But you're right, the government has to do something. We're short in that area, yes. Yes. Excellent, excellent. So that's my hope, cooperatives. I just have a question from online. So this is from Daniel Ampa. He says, I've kindly asked Professor Ganja my questions. How does the USA's approach to food risk and safety compare with other countries, particularly in terms of regulatory standards and enforcement? And two, is the USA doing better? And what are other countries doing better than the USA and things that they could adapt? The, the one thing that we have as an advantage in the US is the trust. And the trust is not we trust it because we want to trust it, but this is the one of the few nations where if something goes wrong, you can sue the USDA, you can sue anybody, and you will get away. You can win. There was an organization that was asked to implement HACCP in Michigan. 
And uh, the U.S. have two policies that if you want to implement a new policy, you have to show that the benefits outweigh the cost. And back then, the U.S. Department of Agriculture had not shown, and they wanted to short cuts in food. They wanted to shut them down because they said they didn't have, they sued the USD and they won. So trust in our system is something that most nations don't have. And that goes a long way with our food safety systems. In Britain, you guys remember Mad Cow? The bed flu issue where Tony Blair, the president went on TV and said British beef is safe took a burger and ate it and said British beef the next day. <laughs> it was a huge outbreak. The, the trust issue when you destroy it, you can't get it back. That's one advantage we have in the US. The, the liability issue that we can hold agencies liable if they are not trustworthy. So I don't, I, I look at the US system. I try to find any system in the world where you can be an agency can do something wrong, I don't see it. Um, I, other than the amount of work that is going on in the background, we also have that advantage. Um, so that's why we always say we have one of the safest food supplies in the world. Yeah. Professor Ngandia, you talked about vomitoxin and the content and the quantity of vomitoxin that's causing sickness. Is that uh, does that affect GMO as well as natural products, or it affects just natural products? Because if GMOs are altered, maybe the uh, vomitoxin will not affect it as much. Yeah, no, vomitoxin is a moisture issue. So if there's heavy rain and heavy moisture, um, you know, we didn't used to have a lot of uh, scab issues in this area until when we got into short season corn. You guys remember when we had a healthy barley? crop in North Dakota, he was, and then we got short season corn because scab and corn are really good friends. And then we kind of eradicated all our two row barley to Canada. So when moisture contents are heavy, it's going to affect us. It doesn't matter if it's, um, unless we have a resistant variety and we don't have a resistant variety so far. We have a moderate resistant variety but it's associated with heavy moisture. Yeah. So it says it is not food if it is not safe. So, and you mentioned the GMO. When I was working on transgenic organisms, GMOs and uh, safety, one of the big problems was subjective nature people see things as not being safe when objectively they are safe um especially with the things that were grass um generally recognized as safe or as the same how does that influence the work that you have here is it purely objective safety measures or is it perceptions of them that might be biased by um various things including fear of uh, one of the reasons the wheat didn't get out is because people were afraid of actually eating wheat directly, but they were fine with corn because livestock eat it. Yeah, and, and this is something that um, we want to revise some of these resistant measures to make sure they have actual hazard on them. Because if we're using just measures that have zero hazard, and everything is perception. I don't think this is safe, so I'm not gonna do it. Our country is not gonna want this because I don't think it's safe. It's not doing any good for science. We have to base everything based on science. And over time, we've seen countries relax their position on GM because they've been looking at the science and says the science is not there about the risk. So my hope is we go away from those perception measures that does not include actual hazard to start looking at actual hazards. And if those actual hazards cannot be shown that GMO has killed A, B, C, D, I gave a town hall presentation to our Alliance group. And um, I had our Alliance group, I gave a presentation on this. And um, 
And one lady was so mad. She said, you know, I have um, cystrose fibrosis because of GMOs and stuff. And she attributed every health situation that she has to GMOs. And just fortunately, uh, Dave Ripplinger had done a conference with actual chemi uh, chemistry professors and a lot of scientists here about GMOs. And the fact that if you eat it in the stomach, before it even gets absorbed, everything gets break down. It's... So I sent her that link. I know she was still mad, <laughs> but uh, I sent her the link to just say, well, this is the science. And the science, if it doesn't show that, um, then it is not science. So I'm hoping that when the World Health Organization and the FDA and all of these guys are talking about it's not, they go to the science. Uh, they don't base it on perception. Yeah, this, so this is uh, an interesting one. Um, some lawsuits, and I don't know how those judges will say GMO is causing A, B, C, D without looking at any publication that says, yeah, it's really GMOs. But you're right. Um, I gave the example of Europe. And Europe is looking at their price floors sometimes. And all their associates, all the African countries, who might need GMOs to feed their population? They might need the food. They don't have food. But they cannot produce GMOs because if they do, Europe will not buy their fresh produce, will not buy their coffee, will not buy their cocoa. And they put a ban on these countries. You can't touch that. So it's a complicated issue. But um, like I said, Sandra and I just submitted a big grant. We hope we get that grant funded. And some of this stuff will start putting real science and public high quality publication. And again, this most of this stuff, if you put it in top A, top journals, published in high quality journals, then it might start shedding light on, yeah, this is a more solid research and solid stuff that has been done. But you're right, some lawyers will probably use their power. They are powerful lawyers that can get away with a lot. Um, so I'm not sure how to address that. But the system, I'm hoping that over time, as things evolve, the real science will be will be more will win. I'm hoping the real science will win. We keep going, or we... did you have a question, Sam? Or? Yeah, I, I know the GMO stuff, everybody is scared to touch it now. <laughs> A lot of companies and folks are scared to touch research on GMOs. Uh, but I did mention when I was in Cameroon, the first biotechnology lab about this, pulling the genes from a yellow cocoyam variety uh, that was a uh, indigenous variety and putting it into a white cocoyam variety that is commercial. The cocoyam is like a, a pitodus, right? But this, we harvest those and after a while, 35% of it rots. We were able to use that technology to pull that and put it on the white cocoyam variety. And that was a US AID project. And we reduced rot from 35% to 5%. 
I hope, and the best, this paper that I got in food distribution research, it was a GMO paper, and I did cite the incident of papaya. That also was able to reduce rot with papaya, and that kukuyam, and some other stuff that have been eaten directly, they're not processed. And people are not dying because they are eating them. So I'm hoping over time we'll see some advancement in research in those. But now most people don't even want to touch those because of the negative perception, not understanding that there's almost nothing you eat in this world that has not been genetically modified. It's been done using traditional plant bleeding, right? But on the other spectrum. So there's a lot of fear of the unknown, which is really not founded. But It is my duty now to to um, apologize first for President Cook was going to be here to do the presentation, but he was called away at the last minute. Provost Bertolini has gracefully uh, uh, agreed to take over this part. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to hand this over to him. Uh, thank you. So yeah, President Cook sends his apologies to you, Dr. Gamzee. Uh, and for a second, I was going to say you get the second best David, but then I recognize that David Buchanan's here. So you get the third best David. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but the Phi Kappa Phi represents the best of NDSU. It is a, you know, it's a rigorous process that you have to demonstrate that you're operating at the highest standards. And Dr. Kanji, you've certainly done that. You're a world-renowned researcher. You've brought in grants and publications. You also meet the land-grant mission of helping the community and the state of North Dakota and the region better, to make it better. You also help your students, which is a, another mission of the land grant institution. You care deeply about them uh, and we're grateful for that. And then on top of that, if it couldn't get any better, uh, he's like a super nice guy. And so uh, I remember the times when we were on the chair there, but you're, you, you've exceeded everything that we could expect. And so thank you so much. We're great for you, grateful for you today and then to commemorate it and mark it, we have a framed poster to show that this happened today. There's also postcards for the friends and family here, but but thank you so much for, for participating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, yeah, this is an area that I'm passionate about, so. I feel a little odd about this, there's cake and uh, coffee and stuff out there in the reception. The Butte, where's Butte? Is it this way or it's this way? It's this way. So please join us out there. Um, at least look at the cake. <laughs> you don't eat any. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Don't have too much sugar.